This is Steven Downs, who is a designer and I mean, in the field of online learning and new media, and he's one of the, the pioneers of this CMOOCs that we talked already about, and will be with us for half an hour and then half an hour of question and answers? Sure. Okay. Is it that one? Yeah. But, okay. Yeah, that one, that one works. Yeah, yeah we fin finally get you on, on loudspeakers. Okay. okay. So, thanks for being with us, and the floor is yours. Okay, well, thanks a lot, and it's uh, really a pleasure to be here and be able to talk to you today. And uh, as you may know, my name is Stephen Downs, and I'm coming to you from Moncton, New Brunswick, Canada, where it's a little bit cold today, but not too bad. Snow on the ground, gray skies, typical March day here in Canada. What I want to talk about today is the concept of the MOOC in context, and in particular, the idea of the MOOC, um, the MOOC, there's, or sorry, I should say, the uh, the ReMOOC in Africa. And I'll, I'll begin by, by saying very clearly I'm not an expert by any means on anything to do with Africa. I visited once. There's a picture from that. But, uh, you know, when it comes to talking about the state of education in Africa, I would certainly have to defer to people who are working on the ground in Africa. So my purpose here is to talk about what we've done with the MOOC and attempt to put that into the context of MOOCs in Africa and the sort of plans that are being discussed by this group. So let me think about for a moment what these plans are specifically. And we'll ignore the, the click to add title thing. There we go. <laughs> uh, here's my understanding of the project today. First of all, to understand the intersection of mobile devices and MOOCs. Secondly, to investigate how this combination can extend and support education in ways not possible before in Africa. To focus on the design and development of a mobile app for remote targeting the African after school student community. Which is a, a concept right off the bat that is, is interesting to me. I've uh, entered the world of mobile computing, of course, with my own Samsung S3. That's kind of not the typical mobile experience, I think, for people in Africa. I looked at uh, some World Bank statistics, and although mobile phone usage is very strong in Africa, smartphones in particular are, are, are still not as widely used as more traditional mobile phones. So we have to keep that in mind and keep in mind that we're not necessarily talking about portable computers the way I might think of mobile phones. But anyhow, that's the first part of this. The second part of this, and I find this really interesting, is the concept of the re-MOOC. And the, the, the re-MOOC is essentially hacking the material coming from MOOCs and enabling a local instructor to create different learning experiences with that. And again, in the context of the after school community, to create a different schedule to re announce a course using the material to integrate it with local sources and annotate and localize the content. Now, this is very interesting to me because. What you're defining as a re-MOOC almost is what I would define as a MOOC. <laughs> so uh, 
I think maybe we'll, we'll begin from that perspective and look at what I think of as a MOOC, keeping in mind the context that we're working with and keeping in mind the mobile phone experience. So my work with MOOCs really began with things like connectivism and connective knowledge in 2008 and we offered it again in 2009 and 2011 and 2012 so we're pretty used to this course. CCK08 as it came to be called was not just our first MOOC but the first MOOC and you're seeing on the screen now some screenshots from that and we thought it would be just an ordinary online course where we'd have 20 or so people sign up but in fact what happened is we had a course where 2300 people signed up. And we also author, offered other courses along the same model Plank 2010 which stands for Personal Learning Environments, Networks and Knowledge and the 35 week long Change MOOC and last year we offered uh, further or Futures of Higher Education 12 which had about 3,000 students in it and in all of these cases we used the model known as the C MOOC. Uh, let me explain what I mean by that. So there's a range of different possibilities for MOOCs. On the one hand you can have MOOCs that are based on content and that really is the sort of MOOC that people have been talking about recently. The, the first one was the artificial intelligence course from Stanford but also we've seen the courses from Coursera, we've seen the uh, other courses in places like Udemy or edX and these are MOOCs that are really based on content whether it be streaming video or audio or text content including things like assignments and online grading and, the, and that sort of stuff. On the other hand we have MOOCs like that are based on the model of networks and these are the MOOCs that we created, MOOCs like CCK08, MOOCs like Plank 2010 and I'll talk a little bit more about what the MOOC as a network looks like through the remainder of this talk and then sort of in the middle and these people deny even that they're MOOCs are the MOOCs that are designed like uh, a series of tasks DS106 is a classic example of that where what they're studying is digital storytelling and what they share are not materials so much but examples of the sorts of things they create while they're studying digital storytelling. So the course really is based around the idea of these creative projects which are essentially ways of practicing the art of digital storytelling. So let me talk a bit about the network approach to MOOC and I'll, I'll keep in mind the other kinds of MOOCs because they are relevant to the current situation, the current context, but I want to talk about what we've developed which were the, uh, the network based MOOCs. And really the way they differ from a traditional course is that they're not linear and they're not structured in any way we might understand that. Here is for example a diagram of the first connectivist MOOC. This was the organization of the course on day one so this does not include any of the student contributions. Up on the upper left we can see a, a sort of traditional structure that's the Moodle learning management system that we used and that part of the course is structured as a traditional course with regular contents, introduction forums, links and the rest of it. 
We also had a wiki, which again was sort of traditionally structured. But then the rest of the course is very much not traditionally structured. And the idea here is what we're trying to do is to create links between different ways people can participate. So for example, we had Flickr, we had Page Flakes, we had Technorati and Technorati search codes. We had delicious tags and delicious search codes. We had people with their own blogs who were submitting their own contents. We had our introductory video. We had a Google group. We had a daily mailing in the form of a daily newsletter. The idea here is that we had a wide range of ways of participating so that people could pick and choose their own way of participating. And, and that was really important in the structure of our MOOC. We wanted to ensure that people had this choice, this autonomy. It really comes down to a question of how you learn in a MOOC. And we have some French here. It says, un processus d'immersion dans une communauté sans champ. Now, what does that mean? It means a process of immersion in a knowing community. And that's exactly what we're trying to create here. This is a, a screenshot from a video that was created by Dave Cormier. And what he's trying to emphasize in this is that in a MOOC, there isn't a body of content that we expect you to master and learn, like, you know, all the dates in history or mathematical formula or that sort of thing. And there isn't a specific set text that you study from. And even though we organize a MOOC, you know, week after week after week, you don't have to follow it in that way. You don't have to study these topics at these times. You can organize the contents the way you want. And most of all, and this is a different video from Dave Cormier, how you define success in a MOOC depends very much on yourself. We, the people who offer a MOOC, don't define success for you. Because we understand that different people have different objectives. One way of characterizing it is that the outcome of a traditional course is knowing something. But the outcome of one of our courses is being able to do something. And when people come into our courses, what, it, what they're trying to do is to be able to do something. And each person has a different thing that he or she is trying to do. And that's what's happening with our interaction here, right? You're engaged in a specific sort of project. And success for me will be not whether you've learned the different parts of MOOCs or how I set up a MOOC, but rather whether what I say here helps you able to accomplish your task of creating a MOOC, or in this case, a re-MOOC, or recreate, never mind. <laughs> so let me tell you what creating a MOOC means for me, keeping in mind that as I say that, you should be asking yourself, is this what creating a MOOC means for you? So to me, creating a MOOC is like creating a network. It's like creating a set of connections between individuals and resources that are out there on the internet. Now in your context, your individual research resources might not always be on the internet. 
And so for me, the first challenge that I'd be thinking of right off the bat is, well, how am I going to create these connections? How do I make these connections when I don't always have the internet to rely on? To create a network, to me, one of the fundamentals is not to centralize, not to put all the focus on one person or one central idea or one source of content but rather to decentralize, to distribute the organization, to distribute the management, to distribute the creation of ideas and indeed even the creation of links. Now, when we create a MOOC online, we're using a social network. And the idea here is that by immersion into the social network, we're creating the conditions that enable a person to create what we might call a personal, uh, a personal network or personal knowledge. The idea here, the thinking behind this is, is that learning isn't simply acquiring a bunch of facts the way you might acquire a bunch of books or uh, you know, a bunch of coffee cups. Learning is like growing. Learning is like developing the brain. In fact, it is literally developing the brain. So instead of delivering education to a person, the idea here is that we're creating an environment, a network, into which a person can immerse themselves and practice being in that network, talking to people who are in that network who may already be experts in the field that they're talking about, exercising themselves, stretching themselves, and trying to become the sort of person who is a person who is in that network. Now, when we create MOOCs, we don't even prepare a whole pile of learning materials and it's kind of interesting you, you look at the what we call the X MOOCs like the artificial intelligence course and Coursera courses and all of that and for them course develop and consists of creating a whole pile of resources a whole a large number of videos and all of that we instead prefer to use open educational resources. And the reason why we prefer to use open educational resources is, well, first of all, it's a lot cheaper. Secondly, they're all out there on the internet anyways. But thirdly, it opens up and in an important way democratizes the, the creation of materials for the course. A way of looking at it is this, that participation in one of these MOOCs, immersion into this network, is essentially to put oneself into a conversation. If you join a MOOC about physics, you're putting yourself into this conversation with real physicists about physics. And ideally, when you're in this MOOC, you and these real physicists are actually going to be doing physics and you'll interact back and forth. The learning materials in the course are to a large degree the actual materials that physicists use when they do physics, whatever they are. You know, physics papers, physics experimental reports, physics diagrams, whatever. I don't know what physicists use because I'm not a physicist. And the idea here is when they create these resources, they share them openly and creating and sharing these resources is like speaking to everybody else in the room, except instead of using words and pictures the way I am, they use their resources that they've created. And then people who are in that community who are responding back, they are also using these resources. 
very often the very same resources that they've collected together, maybe reorganized, maybe rewritten or redrafted or repurposed, expressed in their own language, adjusted to their own local context. And then they pass these back into the conversation. So the physicist and the people learning to do physics are really sending these resources back and forth. And this is something we're actually pretty familiar with in internet communities. This idea of people speaking with more than just words, more than just presentations like this. I did a talk once called Speaking in Lolcats and in that talk I described the way that people use images of cats with silly little text on them in order to express a point. And we do this all the time. We, we express ourselves not just with pictures of cats but with statues with paintings and artwork, with presentations, with drama, with sporting events, with community events, sewing circles, I don't know, the, the, the whole range of cultural phenomena and interactions. When we create a MOOC, we typically think of the MOOC as something that's created online, as something that's based in a social network, but the fundamental core of a MOOC is this conversation. And in my mind, the key to making a MOOC work, whether it's online or offline, whether it's on the internet or on a mobile phone network, is in fostering this conversation, in fostering the creation of and sharing of artifacts that express a point of view or a perspective on the subject matter being taught. And there's no limit, literally no limit, on the mechanisms that you can use in order to make this happen. So, how do you set this up? How do you design one of these things? What are the principles that enables a course as conversation or a course as network to be successful. Well, I mentioned earlier, I think it should be decentralized and I think it should support the concept of learning as growth. So the question is, how do we support these decentralized networks? How do we support the capacity of the network to grow and adapt and be dynamic and responsive to change. Well, to me, that's a form of what might be called network democracy. Now, by this, I don't mean people getting together and voting. That, that's something very different. By network democracy, what I mean are mechanisms to recognize and support the participation of every individual in the network. And I think there are four key principles that underlie this, which together I've given the label the semantic condition. These principles very briefly are autonomy, diversity, openness, and interactivity. And I'll talk about these more in just a couple seconds. But I think these principles are the preconditions for a constructive dialogue. These conditions are what make a network able to grow, able to adapt, able to learn. And thus, these are the design principles for a MOOC. You'll see what I mean when I go through these conditions. I'll go through them one by one here. So, the first of these conditions is what might be called diversity. And by diversity, I don't just mean different languages or different cultures. What I mean is diversity 
from a very broad perspective, if you think of an environment or an ecosystem, an ecosystem is healthier when it's diverse, it's less healthier when it's what, what we call a monoculture, consisting of one single type of planet or organism. You know, and even, even these monocultures are diverse in a certain way. Imagine an ecosystem consisting entirely of rocks. This is not a dynamic ecosystem. It's not one that adapts and that grows. For an ecosystem to develop and to be responsive to change, it needs to have a mixture of different types of things in it. And that's the same in an online course. In an online course, in an online network, a MOOC, we want to foster as many different perspectives as possible, as many different experiences, points of view. But even more than that, we want to encourage people to participate in different ways to draw from different backgrounds, different resource materials, to use different technology. So there may be PC people, there may be Mac people, there may be Linux people. Some people may use Firefox, others may use Internet Explorer. Some people like Microsoft Word, others stay open source. The idea here is it's up to them. And what we're up to as designers of this environment is making this diverse mix possible, enabling people to choose the form and manner of their interaction. And if you wonder about that, think about again our, our, our basic idea that learning is a conversation and think about the conditions that make a conversation possible. If everybody is saying the same thing, and everybody has had the same experience, conversations would be dreadfully boring. It'd be like, I went to the zoo yesterday and I liked it. I went to the zoo yesterday and I liked it. I went, to, you get the idea, right? With, for a conversation to happen, we want different perspectives, different experiences. The idea here is that we bring each of us our own particular perspective into the mix and the conversa conver conversation happens when these perspectives interact. So that's, that's the first of these principles. The second principle I'd like to look at is openness. And the idea here is that our network our course needs to interact with the environment outside of our course. And the principle, and again, if we think of an ecosystem, the principle is based on what makes a successful ecosystem. A closed system that doesn't admit anything, doesn't emit anything, these become stagnant. The raw materials in a closed system become depleted. The system, and I word this very delicately, becomes clogged with the creative product of its members. Uh, you, you can imagine what that creative product might be. An ecosystem, a network, needs to breathe and expire. By expire, I don't mean die. By expire, send off product outside of itself. It needs to interact with that environment around it to, to be a dynamic living thing. From the perspective of an online course, what that means is, well, in one sense, people come into the course, people leave the course. There isn't a clear dividing line between you're in and you're out. There are not barriers to entry. There are not barriers to leaving. What makes the course open and democratic is anyone can come and anyone can leave. It's, it's 
so different than traditional education where you can only come if you're admitted and if you leave you'll be penalized. So this is a very different model, a different perspective. But it's not just people, right? We also want to see content come in, content come in from any source, and we want to see the creative product, whatever it is that people are saying to each other, also freely shareable with the wider community. This gives the course relevance, it gives the course meaning, it, and especially for our circumstance, it gives the course context. When we're thinking about courses in our particular context, what we want to do is, as much as possible, make these courses open to and in the community in which we find themselves. So we want to draw in from the community anything that might be relevant, including people who might not have started in the course. They can join in the course part way through and offer their own unique contribution. And in an ideal world, the course will have an impact on the community. It will say something to the community as a whole. It'll be like, we got together in this course and we did such and such, and here it is. This idea of openness enables the course to breathe, enables the course to live, to change, to adapt, to be responsive, and to be relevant. The third principle is autonomy. And this is the principle that makes this sort of thing possible. Autonomy is the idea that individual entities in the course manage themselves and their growth in their own way. It's, now I want to be clear here, and, and we'll see this with the next criterion. Autonomy doesn't mean nobody interacts with anybody. It, autonomy isn't, you know, you just do your own thing and forget the rest of the world. The idea of autonomy is that ultimately, in conversation with everybody else, you make your own choices about what to accept and about what to reject. And the design of the network is such that we're not attempting to exert control over the networks, but rather we're attempting to create a mechanism whereby individuals making their own decisions can interact with other people in the conversation. Finally, the fourth principle is interactivity. And interactivity has a couple of levels, right? On the one hand, we need to think of our, our network, our course, as a sequence of interactions. And the, the idea here is that the system grows, the system acts, reacts, learns, by and through the interaction of its parts. As I put on the slide, the system can't grow unless the parts interact. Flowers need bees, cows need grain, beavers need trees, etc. And growth is created in a community not by accumulation, but by flow. This constant activation and interaction. You know, there's maybe a political comment that could be made, but also an epistemological comment that can be made about what happens when one part of the system simply accumulates and accumulates and accumulates. But more than that, interactivity is about the product of the community being more than is created by any individual member of the community. Think about a conversation. The conversation is something over and above the contributions of any individual in that conversation. The conversation is something that's created by the people working together. 
We have a lot of phenomena in society like that. In fact, society as a whole is like that. But think of even something simple like building and flying an aircraft. This is not something that's done by one person. It takes an entire community interacting, not necessarily working together, because each person has their own purpose and objective. But through these interactions, we as a, society, as a society are able to accomplish things like flying an aircraft from New York to Paris. We as a society are able to understand and comprehend complex phenomena that no individual working by themselves could manage. And it's this new learning that is the product or the outcome of the, the network that we're talking about. So those are the four principles of successful MOOCs. Those are the four principles that we attempted to create when we created our own MOOCs. And then we look at what we think success is, and what we think success is, is how we as individuals are able to participate in and communicate with each other in this network. We recognize our own understandings by looking at how we work and develop within this social interactive network. So that basically is the, the talk that I wanted to give, this overview of the concept of a MOOC and how to design a MOOC. And now what I'd like to do is stop and turn it over to questions and comments and see how what I've had to say uh, relates to your own experiences and your own project. Oh, thank you. Uh, so thanks, Steve, for the, the inspiring talk, and I wonder if there are questions. Uh, we're trying to, to switch on the light. Sure. Uh, oh, there we go. Nothing. <laughs> oh, oh, there we go. <laughs> uh, yeah, you talked about not centralizing as you spoke, but that is actually the main part of the scene. Um, but I mean, there is still one professor that makes a list of, of, of interesting stuff, and, and still, there is still a central component in there. Well, there is a component, to be sure. I mean, when we set up our MOOCs, we didn't disappear and go away. As, as I kept telling people, this is not constructivism. We're not going to fade off to the side. But our participation was not a management type of participation. And, and the way I tried to explain it in that course and in other courses is that it was similar to the participation that a professor would undertake in those traditional Oxford or Cambridge style uh, schools where the students would organize themselves into societies, into learning societies, because each of them managed their own learning in cooperation with a professor who would serve as their mentor. But they'd organize themselves into a learning society. And one of the activities of these learning societies would be to convince a professor, an expert in their, in their subject, to come and speak to them. And often what they would do is they would get these professors to come in and give a series of talks, or to use the, the vocabulary of the day, a course of lectures. And so 
this would be what the professor provided. And there's no sense here that the professor is leading the class, but rather the professor is saying, okay, I'm going to come in. I'll give you five talks over five weeks on the subject of epistemology. Make of it what you will. And the professor might say, uh, I'm going to talk about Moore's theory of knowledge. And as you know, Moore wrote this and that and the other thing. So these are some background readings that I'll be referring to when I make the talk. Make of those what you will. And the participants in these classes would read more, and they'd read criticisms of more, and they might read other materials related to what Moore said, common sense, understanding of knowledge, truth, and other similar sorts of subjects, and they'd come in to the discussions, to the lectures, ready not simply to listen to the professor, but also to interact in a conversation with the professor and with each other about the subject of that lecture. That's very different from something that centralizes, right? Because we have a variety of different people playing a variety of different roles here. And we have a very loose structure and we have people making their own determinations about their manner of participation. There's another question. I'm sorry, I can't hear that. It's about how, how do you do put how, how do you put exams into this uh, architecture of CMOOCs, plain things? Well, the, the short answer is you don't. <laughs> uh, I, I know. It, in a lot of educational contexts, people need to demonstrate their learning, even if it was a different kind of learning. They need to do it by means of tests, examines, examinations, and the like. From my perspective, as somebody who provides a MOOC, I have no particular interest in applying exams, and, and certainly even less interest in grading them. To me, uh, uh, the test of a person's success, as I mentioned, is found in their interaction with the network as a whole, rather than a highly structured artificial question and an answer kind of format. That said, the way we set up our MOOC is that institutions, other institutions, could cooperate with us. And what we did is we said, we have this MOOC as this learning environment, this learning ecology that people can participate in. You can make this MOOC part of your course in your institution. So the person in your institution can come into the MOOC, do all this stuff, and then go back to your institution and submit themselves to testing or examination according to your own, your own local criteria. So we focus, we focused on the learning aspect and we allowed the institutions to focus on the examining aspect. And we even went to the point, and this was mostly George and not myself, but we even went to the point where we made assessment rubrics uh, and, and that sort of thing also available as some of the materials, some of the resources we provided with this course. So an institution participating with us could just pick up our rubrics and look at the sort of questions we would ask in our test or our exam and apply that locally and then test and evaluate the results locally. So how do you approach exams? in a MOOC, the, the answer is as decentralized as possible and as localized as possible to meet the needs of particular institutions or particular communities. Uh, 
Um, actually, Siva, I have a I have a curiosity and and a comment. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the, this I mean, all these pillars that you that you illustrated are somehow, in my opinion, uh, immediately applicable to this uh, remook uh, in the African context, and it is also related to several ideas that we discuss uh, with the students today. And mostly, I mean, the, the, the exam issue actually is, uh, is related to the, the fact that probably, I mean, in Africa, more than in the Western countries, there, there is the need to, 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 to get something out of the education itself. So like this passing of the national exam for the, I mean, after the high school, is one of the most important issues for an African student, for example. But uh, I wonder if you have the statistics of access to this CMOOCs that you, you are organizing from the development, the developing countries, or I mean, if you can give us an idea of the, the ratio of access. That's a, uh, that's a good question. I can tell you right off the bat that we definitely had people from developing countries in our courses, but I should be clear that I believe that the majority of participants were from developed countries and especially uh, North America and Europe. Of those developing countries, the bulk came from Spanish speaking environments of Central and South America, and then, of course, to some degree, Spain. Although I'm not sure I'd call Spain a developing country. <laughs> I don't think they'd be too pleased if I did that. Uh, I can't speak to, you know, success rates or anything like that because, you know, we, we didn't really evaluate success because there is no central measure of success we can apply. You know, the, the best I can do is, is point to the activity that has taken place since we created our original MOOCs and we've seen an interest in MOOCs and the creation of MOOCs not just in North America and Europe but around the world. And, you know, that, that sort of interest is expressed, for example, by MOOCs that sprang up in India and MOOCs that sprang up in South America. But actual numbers, I can't give you those. Uh, I'm not, you know, I just haven't done that kind of study. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. What kind of places do you see you would want seniors to evolve? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. Uh, he's asking what, what kind of place and what kind of development, I mean, what kind of future scenario do you see for the CMOOC? Hmm. And I would add, if you see, I mean, my, my taking from the remook and the reason why I choose to, to have the brief about remooking is because, I mean, with all this high level material coming from what you call X moves. Yeah. I mean having some sort of uh joining uh reality could be interesting to me. Yeah. It's I mean that's a really interesting question and it raises a number of issues because well, you know, the the terms of use for a large number of these X moves is such that you can't use their materials to create your own MOOCs. You know, you have to go to their site, use their materials. They're not materials that you can take, you know, repurpose, remix, share among yourselves, all of that. So right off the bat, there's a bit of an issue there that you're going to need to address, but I expect you'll address it the way I'd address it. And You'll, you'll address it by bringing in your own materials, bringing in things that are relevant to you. And, and you know, you may work with the structure of the X MOOC, but you'll use your own materials and your own resources. Um, 
in the future of the MOOC. I mean, I think even the X MOOCs are going to have to understand, and they will understand eventually, that what they need to do is create some sort of learning community around the whole concept of whatever the subject of the MOOC is. So, you know, we have the artificial intelligence MOOC. Over time, a community builds up around that concept and that idea. And the artificial intelligence course becomes, over time, just one resource that's being used by that community. And I think that's going to be the same with the other MOOCs as well. And the challenge, especially especially for regions of lower or more difficult connectivity, the challenge will be to be a part of that wider worldwide community. Because I, I think, like right now we think of MOOCs as these standalone, very coarse-like entities, and they are. But we're going to see them more and more in the future as, you know, like events or happenings that permeate a larger social fabric, a larger community. So there's the larger physics community, and in that community from time to time a MOOC happens, which coalesces some ideas or some way of thinking. And then, you know, so it sort of happens, it grows and develops, and then it goes away. And then another one happens, grows, develops, and goes away. But it all happens on this fabric of this overall community. And so the challenge for people in different institutions in different places would be not simply, well, can we create our MOOCs and, and do the same thing here, but how can we create our MOOCs and do the same thing here as part of this larger community? How can we draw these connections, these ties together? So that not we're just off in the corner doing something on our own, but so we're connected with the rest of this global community. Does that make sense? And that's, to me, that's probably the largest challenge of this initiative. But it's also the point where it can have its greatest success. You know, because, you know, I, I grew up in a small town, in a rural town. And the biggest thing about growing up in a small town or a rural town is this sense of separateness. That there's the whole world out there and I'm not in it. And it's just not right, just I'm not in it. And, you know, and people growing up in small towns in Canada, the first thing they want to do is get out of that small town and go to some place where stuff is happening. And, you know, that that applies to entire regions, entire provinces. You know, I, I live in New Brunswick, which is a small province in eastern Canada. And people grew up here and say, oh, I want to get out of here and go to Ontario or Montreal or Vancouver or someplace where something is happening. And the challenge for us here is to become a part of that global community so that people don't say, well, I've got to leave and get out of here to be a part of that. So how do you connect a local community like ours? And even ours, ours even has pretty good connectivity. We have good internet here. But there's still that challenge, that isolation, that we're not joined with them. We, we can't just, you know, get in a car and drive across town to, to this conference or this event. Uh, and, and how do we become part of these events? How do we have events that other people will be a part of? And I really think that the key to making this happen is, is developing and accessing these, these communities, these networks. Okay, so if there is no other questions, I, I know that you have an appointment in three minutes. So I, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you again. Thanks so much for staying with us and uh, hope to, to have you again. Just thank you very much. And again, in the spirit of openness, I've recorded the audio of this. I've recorded the video of this. Yeah. And yeah. it will all be available on my website at downs.ca 
and we'll share this with not just with you but with anyone who's interested okay thanks a lot thanks a lot bye, -bye. bye everyone Bye.